All right, let's begin with prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for your care for us, the way you provide for our needs, the way you grant us grace and strength for our perseverance. We thank you for the means of grace, which you have determined as the means to preserve us in the world. And we pray that we would be faithful in our use of them. And we pray that as we consider this final element in the early piety in the book of Acts, uh, that we would receive your instruction with humility and thanksgiving, and that we would be prepared to implement changes, create new priorities, establish new commitments, and that all of these things would be done for the glory of our Savior, whose name we pray. Amen. All right, let's go all the way back now to Acts chapter 2, 41 through 47. So those who received Peter's message were baptized. And there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. All right, just as a reminder, one of the key words in this passage is they devoted themselves, which suggests what their highest priorities were. The word devote means to stick by or be close at hand, attach oneself to, wait on, be faithful to someone, or with a different nuance, to persist in something. And my Greek dictionary lists the words hold fast to, continue, persevere in something as the best way to translate our passage in Acts 2.42. The word is only used 10 times in the New Testament. 60% of those occurrences, or six times, come in Acts. And we're going to go back a little bit later to see exactly how that word is used. But for now, we are coming to prayer. Prayer as an essential part of piety in the book of Acts. And as I've noted previously, by stressing the essential piety, I'm implying that there are non-essential expressions of piety, with even the possibility, when we look at the entire history of Israel and the church, that non-essential forms of piety may actually, ironically, compete with essential practices. So you could say good is the enemy of best if best is neglected in favor of something that just might be good. So they devoted themselves to the prayers. And this comes in the middle of a book series. 
the Luke-Acts pairing, volume one and volume two, that has a special interest in the subject of prayer. I just did an English uh, word search on the word pray with a little asterisk at the end, which gives me all the, the words that have pray in it, praying, prayer, prayed, so forth. The word occurs 58 times in Luke Acts, 28 in Luke, 30 in Acts. Now just to get some perspective, the word occurs 32 times in Matthew, Mark, and John combined. So Luke 28 times, Acts 30 times, 32 total for the other three Gospels, 18 in Matthew, 12 in Mark, and only two in John's Gospel. Now, statistics all by themselves may not tell us that much. You don't want to conclude, for instance, that John doesn't think prayer is very important, so he doesn't mention it very much. In fact, the, the words for prayer occur twice in one verse in John, when Jesus is praying in John chapter 17. But they might provide a clue in terms of this study to the importance of prayer to piety, to the practice of godliness that Luke believes needs attention. And so I think if we look at uh, the details, it will support this working hypothesis. So taking Luke and Acts as a whole, it's interesting to observe that Luke's story practically begins with prayer. The people and the priest are both praying. You remember that scene uh, in the temple? Zechariah has received, um, he's drawn the straw uh, to serve inside the holy place. He's at the temple, or excuse me, at the altar of incense. And while he is in there at the altar of incense, which probably symbolizes prayer, Luke tells us that the people outside the temple were praying. And so when the angel Gabriel appears, he appears to one man who, along with his wife, are the embodiment of Jewish piety uh, as far as, well, the Old Testament is concerned. And when we learn that Elizabeth, his wife, is barren and she is advanced in years, what do you think of? Say you're just reading that for the first time. Sarah. Right, so what do you think of? As, you're, as if you were reading a story. Yeah, something's going to happen, right? Because when you're watching stories on TV, because that's the, probably the main form of media now, don't you, can't you predict what's going to happen based on a few factors earlier in the story? I like to show off to my wife by saying, this is going to happen next, and then prophetically I'm proved true. It's kind of sad actually because that means television stories often just recycle the same tropes over and over again. But in the story of redemptive history, we've got enough behind us to know that when Luke introduces Zechariah and Elizabeth as righteous, they're righteous in Israel, but she's barren and she's old and they've never had children. Well, that's just not a little bit of color to the story. It's a signal 
that God is about to do something. Because that's where those stories begin, God's intervention. You can think of, you mentioned Sarah, you can think of um, um, Hannah, right? Um, Samson's mother, which I can't remember if she had been barren off the top of my head. Anyone remember? Sam. Well, Samuel's mother is Hannah, and she never had children while her fellow wives were doing quite well. Samson's mother, there are a few other examples. So, you just know something's going to happen. So, while Zechariah is on duty, He'd been chosen by Lot. The whole multitude of the people were praying outside. Gabriel appears to Zechariah and says, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. And of course, Elizabeth will have a baby boy who will be named John. That's how Luke begins. And it's no coincidence, I think, that Acts chapters 1 and 2 are also set in Jerusalem, either in or around the temple, so that we read in Acts chapter 1, 12 through 14, right after Jesus ascended into heaven, then they, the disciples, returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot and Judas the son of James. All these with one accord were devoting themselves, same word from Acts 2, devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. So, both books in the combined series start in similar ways. They start with prayer. Well, back to Luke. Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Zechariah respond to God's blessing with prayer. Prayer and praise. And as the story moves forward, remember this is all material that's unique to Luke. That's why we're covering it. Just to stress Luke's interest in the subject. In chapter 2, as the story moves back to Jerusalem and back to the temple, when Mary and Joseph bring Jesus there to be circumcised, we meet Simeon. And Simeon responds to seeing the Messiah by blessing God. That is, he begins to pray. Though it's not a petitionary prayer, except that he says, you can, you can let me die now. But it is a form of speech toward God. Then we turn right around and meet Anna. And Anna is the one who did not depart from the temple. She worshipped with fasting and prayer night and day. Again, this is all material that belongs to Luke. So Luke seems to draw attention to prayer whenever he has the opportunity. For instance, while each synoptic gospel writer, and John for that matter, has a record of Jesus' baptism, only Luke has this. Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. Now just let me take a quick poll. How many of you recognize that basic story, the baptism of Jesus? Don't bother raise your hands. I'm kidding, Kara. Thank you for raising your hand. 
How many of you knew that Luke singles out a mention of Jesus himself praying at his baptism? I can't tell because no one raises their hand yes or no. Nod. Okay, thank you, Brian. Yes. This is one of the, the most fascinating things that I learned while I was in seminary. And I've got this big blue book on my shelf. And you open it and it goes through the entire gospel record. Um, mostly the synoptics because John is off doing his own thing. But if John in any way crosses with the synoptics, they put that in too. But it's there in columns. Okay, so yeah, look on the page. Matthew, Mark, Luke, story by story. And in very concentrated small print, there is the story. Now you read devotionally, for instance. You read Matthew. Then you're ready to start Mark. And Mark says the same thing that Matthew said. Okay, that's good. Then you read Luke, and Luke says the same thing that Matthew and Mark just said. And after a while, you wonder what's the point of telling the same story three times. But when you spend this kind of time looking at, eat, they call them pericopes, these kind of paragraphs lined up, we had to do uh, underlining with four different color pens. So if Luke and Matthew had the same words different than Mark, that was one color. If all three had the exact same words, that was another color. If Mark and Matthew had words that Luke didn't have, that was another color. And then the other way around, if Luke uh, and Mark agree and Matthew doesn't, that's another color. So if you were to open it, you would see all these different colored lines running through the text. This exercise is absolutely fascinating because it opens up one of the best reasons for giving us basically three different versions of the same story. You begin to see patterns that when Luke tells this story, like the one we've just looked at, he wants to bring out something that Matthew and Mark didn't bring out. He wants us to know that Jesus prayed. Oh, the Synoptic Gospels are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Why? What does the word mean? Soon is with, together. Anyone? Same view, isn't it? Yeah, well, we use the word synopsis to describe. I'm not sure it's the same function there. Google. Yeah, I'll check that out. But what's happening then, again, if because we read them one after the other, we may not pick up on this, but when their material is right in front of us, it becomes pretty clear that Mark is the first gospel writer and that Matthew and Luke actually had a copy of Mark when they wrote their gospels. But then like artists or maybe we could even say authors and biographers, they begin to bring out a different element in the ministry of Jesus that expresses their viewpoint. Now it may have to do with whatever community the gospel writers were writing to at the outset, but now we have three different portraits of Jesus while always being the same Jesus. So um, 
How many of you have ever read a biography of, say, Abraham Lincoln? Okay, a few of you. There's only one biography of Lincoln out there, right? Of course not. I've got two at least, three if you count um, the one on uh, his being um, a Christian or I think, anyway. There are tons of biographies. You don't just read the same thing over and over in each biography, right? This author says, I would like to focus on uh, Lincoln's relationship with the Senate. This author here is more interested in his marriage. This author here has just found something new uh, that gives us insight into his law career when he worked in Springfield and made the circuit. This is true for all sorts of famous people. Now put that into the inspired context of the gospel and it's like asking three great painters to paint a portrait of Jesus but with their own take. So we have three Jesuses, if you will. It's all the same person, it's all the same ministry, but Picasso's, Rembrandt's, and Van Gogh's don't look exactly alike. And in fact, you can tell who did whom, right? It's just that way with the Gospels. Extremely valuable tool in understanding Jesus. And that's a perfect example of it. Anna, Simeon, Zechariah, and Elizabeth, that's all peculiar to Luke. Matthew and Mark don't touch the subject. But the baptism, the baptism, well, we all have baptism accounts in the Gospels. And you ask yourself, because you're always asking yourself questions, you're always asking yourself why. Why? 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 Why did Luke tell us that Jesus was praying at his own baptism? See, in fact, I have that in my notes. So what should you do when you notice something like this? Ask why. Ask why, right. And then you begin to discover patterns. Very quietly going on below the radar. But Jesus calls his 12 apostles. Matthew chapter 10 verse 1. And he called, and he called to him, to himself, his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. Mark 3, 13 through 14, or 14a. And he went up on the mountain and called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him, and he appointed twelve. Okay, so we have two versions of Jesus calling the twelve, separating them from who knows how many disciples. Luke 6, 12 through 13, same story. In these days, he went out to the mountain to pray. And all night he continued in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them twelve whom he named apostles. Did anyone notice anything significantly different in Luke's version of the 12 calling than Matthew and Mark? We did, didn't we? Prayer, and not just a prayer, all night prayer on the mountain. Okay? Jesus' transfiguration. Matthew 17, 1 through 2. And these are the, these are the biggie events, right? in the story of Jesus. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John his brother and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his face 
shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And after six days, Mark tells us, Mark 9, 2 through 3, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John. The wording there is identical, so we're assuming this is Mark's original version taken over by Matthew. And he led them up a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became radiant intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. Luke 9, 28 through 29. Now about eight days after these sayings, he took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered and his clothing became dazzlingly white. Anyone noticing a pattern now? That Luke has an interest in the subject of prayer. We don't have to think about why, about Luke's community. Just to see that when Luke paints Jesus' portrait, he wants this aspect of Jesus' ministry to come out again and again and again. And just off the top of your heads, why? Why would Luke want to do this? I don't even care if you're right or wrong, but you're asking why, why? Why might he want to do this? Some people find praying more easy than others. Right, okay, or maybe he wants to encourage prayer, especially for those who don't find it very easy. We're just dreaming a little bit here. That's how you do the work. I think of Luke, I think of he's always looking from the perspective of the poor. Prayer goes with, with being poor. You're asking, you're, uh, it's, it's uh, someone who is in need that's looking to someone who can benefit him. And, Okay, so some sense of neediness and dependence on God expressed through prayer. It also shows Jesus' connection to God before these miraculous events happen. I mean, if you read the other accounts, it almost sounds like Jesus is just showing off. <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah. Whereas... I mean, even with the healings and stuff, I believe, and if, if you read Luke's account, you see that he's talking to God about it, and, you know, then that's a direct thing from God. It's not Jesus just saying, hey, look what I can do, be healed, or hey, look what I can do, it comes a dove, or, you know. Right. You know. Well, if, if I were to combine both of your suggestions, maybe we could think that Luke is saying, Hey, Jesus depended on God, and he expressed his dependence by prayer. I'm going to use a word at the very end of this, or a little phrase at the end of this morning's sermon. I'll prepare you for it now, um, because it, it's a difficult little phrase, but uh, I think many Christians struggle with an implicitly docetic Christology. Hmm? So when you're hanging around your other Christian friends, you can say, you know, the other day we were talking about this trend toward an implicitly docetic Christology. What do you think? And they'll be really impressed. You're so, wow. You're cool. It's a fancy way of saying that Christians treat Jesus as if he only appeared to be human. We don't believe that. Whenever we confess our faith, 
whether the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, or the relevant catechism questions, we insist that Jesus is fully God and fully man, that there are two separate natures united in the one Christ. And then we try and figure out what that would ever look like. They don't mix together to create kind of a third thing. The both natures remain intact, and yet there is some type of connection between them without uh, losing anything that belongs to either nature. But in our struggle to hold that together, if you're like me, and like my students when I was at Whitfield, we just kind of naturally drift over to the divine Jesus. So that functionally, just functionally, not confessionally, Jesus is God walking around in a man suit. I'm not saying we actually believe that, and I'll it, this makes sense in the sermon. I didn't just want to get the words implicit docetic Christology in today. It, it will fit, believe me. If Luke says, boy, every time Jesus had to make an important decision, he went to God and prayed and prayed and prayed about it, does that sound like Jesus, or rather God, walking around in a man suit? I don't think so. I think it sounds like a man. Someone who is fully human. And in that sense is dependent on God like we are. And therefore is, as it were, an advertisement for the value of prayer in our relationship to God. In other words, you could reason this way. If Jesus had to pray, don't you think maybe you should pray too? That's just a suggestion. All right, anything else on that? Yes, Kara. Thank you, Kara. Sure. I don't, I'm not, this isn't quite the subject at hand, but I'm just curious if you could sum up real quick. Why is John set apart from the synoptic? Um, have we talked about that in the sermon series on John? Probably. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually asking that sincerely. I, I don't remember. John, of, of, just off the top of my head, because the gospel writers didn't just sit down and write. They probably wrote for specific audiences that had just like the apostles wrote, or rather Paul and James wrote to churches. John may have been pushing back against um, too much human nature at the expense of the divine. Because that is, of course, a problem in the early church that centuries later emerged as Arianism. So maybe John is, in a sense, pulling back the other way because people who can't fathom the God becoming a human being refuse to accept it. You either say it was God, but he only appeared to be human. He really wasn't human. Or you say... He was a really extraordinary individual, but he wasn't God. Right? Do you see the difference? That, that's a possible explanation for what John is doing. Are, are the four uh, gospel writers contemporary? Well, they're all within probably 50 years of each other, maybe 40. John is generally considered the last one. Oh, well, if you were to look at that book I was talking about, John never shows up. He has very little material in common with Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Where Matthew, Mark, and Luke are uh, 
agreeing all the way through. In the first three books, history is explaining, or the, the, the narrative of the story is explaining a lot of who Jesus is. And right. Who Jesus is explaining who Jesus is. Right. Yeah, these, particularly these long discourses. Well, let me, let me go on. We can pick that topic up again. Um, Matthew 6, Jesus teaches his disciples the Lord's Prayer in the context of teaching them about prayer. And Luke 11, 1, Now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. Mark doesn't have the Lord's Prayer. So in Luke, they see Jesus actually praying and ask him, teach us to pray. It doesn't occur within a teaching about the Lord's Prayer. This is followed by a longer discourse on prayer, which Matthew does not have, right? The story about the guy who goes to his friend's house at midnight because he's got surprise visitors and he wants bread and he's going to just, <laughs> I'm staying at the door until you come out. So one way or the other, I don't care if your kids are in bed, I have, I have guests. So the owner of the home is, he'll just get fed up and he'll go give the guy the bread. Jesus says, pray like that. Annoy God until he relents. Does that sound like piety to you? It's fantastic. Just bug him. And then, of course, it's after that story that Jesus talks about, you know, knocking and seeking and so forth. He who knocks, the door will be open. The parable of the widow and the unjust judge is also unique to Luke. And in a sense, it becomes a little bit of a commentary on um, Luke chapter 11. And it begins this way. And he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. And so, who is God in the story of the parable of the widow and the unjust judge? The unjust judge, right? It has to do with how we read parables. The widow wants justice, and so she starts showing up everywhere where this guy is and says, hey, remember me and how you stole my land? And that. The judge is finally fed up with it, and he says, look, I'll, I'll find in your favor. Luke says, you should pray like that. Maybe that's why Jesus prayed all night on the mountain. He was trying to, if you will, bug God until God gave up what Jesus wanted. The parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector, also unique to Luke. It follows that parable of the widow and the unjust judge. What do the two men who go up to the temple have in common, the publican and the Pharisee, the tax collector and the Pharisee. They both go up to the temple to pray. And only one of them prays in such a way as to leave justified. Okay? Now, this is not a piety in the Gospel of Luke Sunday school class. But if the book of Acts has this history behind it, from Zechariah and Elizabeth all the way to the resurrection of Jesus, then I think we would miss out on a lot if we started fresh from scratch in Acts chapter 242. Uh, 242. It's as if we've already got this kind of rapid stream flowing and their devotion to the prayers is just a part of that stream, almost as if at each stop it gains more and more momentum.
And I'm also ready to draw at least one early conclusion from this survey. And it sounds a little bit uh, like what Bob suggested earlier. Prayer and praying is perhaps the most democratic aspect. No. The most democratic activity in the Christian church. D little d, right? Not go out and campaign for Obama activity. In other words, everybody can do it. Who wants to preach the sermon this morning? Penny? You got something ready? Would any of you guys be bothered if Penny came up and preached the sermon this morning? There's probably only a few people within the audience right now who are, quote, eligible to preach on a Sunday morning. But in Presbyterianism, if you're not an ordained minister, strictly speaking, you cannot preach. What do Presbyterians do when they send a ruling elder up there? He exhorts. We kind of want to protect preaching as that unique activity that's invested in the minister or teaching elder. But everybody here can pray. And having an office in the church, deacon or elder, in my opinion anyway, does not make the officer's prayers more valuable or more effective than anyone else's. Does that sound right? I think so. Some of you might be better prayers than me or the elders. Just because I was ordained does not mean that I took a few steps closer to God so that when I speak, it's easier for him to hear me than it is to hear you. So this is the most... James, uh, when he re Elijah prayed that it would not rain, and we think, well, he's a prophet of God, and so of course Elijah can pray that it won't rain and it doesn't rain, but when James refers to that, he says, no, Elijah was a man just like us, and he prayed, <laughs> and this is what happened. Right. He puts it that way that it wasn't because he was a prophet. He just prayed. Right. A man like us. He's a righteous man. And so righteous might be a good prerequisite for praying. But I don't think James means perfectly in conformity with the will of God when he uses righteous. So yes, it's not his prophetic office. I think that's an excellent point, Bob. It's not his prophetic office that commends him to God. And therefore, he's worthy of our imitation. Otherwise, I might get discouraged and say, oh, well, yeah, sure, Jay, he was a, just a prophet. What did you expect? So, yes, it's the most democratic activity in the Christian church. There are no real prerequisites that must first be met before a believer can pray. Except, of course, the believer is a believer that is genuinely transformed. There are qualifications for elders in the New Testament. There are qualifications for deacons in the New Testament. There are no qualifications for people to pray. I don't think there is a minimum level of maturity that's called for, nor is there a requirement for certain public gifts. And if we survey redemptive history all the way up to Acts chapter 1, the, that upper room scene where they were all in one accord and praying, well, even tax collectors can pray. Hannah, we mentioned earlier, prays for a child. And she's, she's a woman. 
I'm speaking from the perspective of Old Testament patriarchy. And God heard her and answered her. A Roman centurion can pray and have his prayers heard by God. We'll look at him in a little bit, Cornelius. So if you think about it, you guys and Jesus have this form of piety in common, which I think is why Luke wants us to see that Jesus is always praying, where Matthew and Mark have other interests. You both can pray to your Father in heaven. Are there certain words and formulas that are required before prayer is effective? No. I, I actually am going to read the Shorter Catechism's definition of prayer. We can close with that. But it's, it's, it's excellent. <coughs> Question 98. What is prayer? Prayer is an offering up of our desires unto God. Whatever is on our hearts is what we bring to God for things agreeable to His will, in the name of Christ, with confession of our sins and thankful acknowledgement of His mercies. But that first line, it's all of us share that in common, an offering up of our desires unto God. Probably, for the most part, it's going to be verbal, actual words. But I suspect somewhere in there, there might be things that are less verbal, even if they are just groans and tears. There is still a prayer dimension to that. So, we'll stop there. Um, and we'll pick up in two weeks on Acts 242 in prayer.